everyone. Welcome to this evening's World Affairs program. My name's James Palmer. I'm a deputy editor with Foreign Policy Magazine in DC. I also spent 15 years in China, uh, working both for Chinese media and foreign media there, uh, and traveled the region a fair bit. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about Taiwan, China, um, Ukraine, and Hong Kong, and the interplay between these ideas of authoritarianism, invasion, and uh, the, how, how these states learn from each other. We're hosted today by World Affairs, a San Francisco-based nonprofit, nonpartisan forum that explores international issues and ideas beyond borders in all their nuance and complexity. I'm joining you from Sitka, Alaska, a tiny town of about uh, 8,000 people on the northern Pacific coast but one that even here uh, has been touched by these global events. Um, I, meant, I was down at the uh, fisheries earlier where Ukrainian workers who come over to process the fish working for what would be minimum wages in the US, but uh, uh, strong wages back in Ukraine, um, joy, come here for months every year, sending remittances back. They're deeply concerned about the fate of their families at home. Several of them were saying they were considering going back to fight. As I went along the docks today, uh, seeing the cruise ships come in, of course, a mixture of Taiwanese and Chinese tourists, the sense of a global world in which even these tiny places are connected. And our guests today are joining us from Taiwan itself. So the past few years, we've seen attention grabbing flashpoints across the globe. And with the recent shift in attention to Taiwan, the military drills there that just ended, but are likely to come back in other forms, what can we expect? What's China thinking? When it looks at Ukraine, does it see uh, the possibility of its future in Taiwan? Or does it fear what could happen in terms of global response? What does all this mean for the Taiwanese people and for global democracy? How do these different points of repression and aggression um, interact with each other? And what do they tell us about the current moment and what might happen? With experience reporting from Hong Kong, Ukraine, and Taiwan, we're joined today by Nicola Smith and Tommy Walker. Nicola is Asia correspondent for the UK's Telegraph newspaper and has been based in Taipei for six years, covering major political and social developments in East and Southeast Asia, from global tensions across Taiwan and North Korea to the Hong Kong protests and Myanmar coup. This year, she also traveled to Ukraine for a temporary assignment. Tommy Walker is an award-winning journalist who's predominantly reported within Asia, is now based in Taipei. In 2019 and 2020, Tommy covered the Hong Kong anti-government protests and the news on the national security law, which finalized Beijing's grip on the city. This year, he reported from Eastern Europe and Russia's war in Ukraine. Now, we're going to, I'm going to ask questions first of all, but I'm very keen to hear questions from the audience. If anybody has a question, please ask it in the Q&A feature and we'll do our best to answer it towards the end of the program. Nicola and Tommy, welcome to World Affairs. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for having me. So you're both in Taiwan though now, I know it's early in the morning there or early in the morning by journalist standards anyway. <laughs> we've heard a lot of talk about, we've heard a lot of talk about tensions in Taiwan, fears across the strait, worries in the wake of the Pelosi visit about uh, Chinese aggression, even invasion. Nikki, what's the mood like on the ground there? The mood on the ground is, you know, remarkably normal. People are just getting on with their lives. Um, uh, you know, they're not thinking about geopolitics all the time. Obviously, there are moments where it's much more in the news and people are um, more focused on, on uh, what could happen across the strait. But generally, you know, you go out and, and the kids about to go back to school, businesses are functioning as normal. So for the general population, um, they have been living with threats from China for so long now that it's just kind of part of the background noise. And then you have moments where there's a lot of international attention and, and, and they're thinking about it more. Um, and I think there was so much focus on the Pelosi visit, naturally. Um, it, it was a big moment in, in the news cycle and it, it was a big moment for, for Taiwan as well. But... I've, I've really noticed the mood has shifted a lot more since the invasion of Ukraine, um, rather than the Pelosi visit. That just added to what was already accumulating. And, and uh, as you mentioned, I've been here since 2016, 
And I've really noticed in the past, um, past six months that there has been a bit of a shift in the public mood, that people were, people were anxiously watching what had happened to Ukraine because it, it took everyone so much by surprise and it took the Ukrainian public so much by surprise that I think it was a real wake up call for, for Taiwan that really focused the public's minds. The government and the military have always been kind of making contingency plans, but the difference I noticed this time was that it, there was just a lot more public interest in what was happening um, to the Ukrainians. And then it just really raised the question in people's minds, what if that happens to us? What if this worst case scenario comes to our shores as well? How would we react? What would we do? How could I protect my family? Do you think that the Ukrainian resistance has been inspiring to Taiwan? Have people been moved by it? Or you know, does it make them think that fighting China might be more possible than before? Yes, I definitely think it, it, it has done. I mean, it, it's hard to generalize, but my, you know, my overall impression is that uh, it has inspired people. Uh, it's definitely inspired a, a section of Taiwanese uh, society that they've seen that even though there is a parallel where Russia and China are so much uh, bigger than Ukraine and Taiwan, and this, it's this kind of overwhelming sense of, well, you know, they've got so much firepower, but um, Taiwanese have definitely seen how the Ukrainian population has got involved and fought back and resisted, and whether that's been, you know, signing up to the Ukrainian military or the territorial defense force or um, whether it's been involved more in humanitarian aid or just, you know, resisting in in um, uh, less combative ways. I think what the Ukraine crisis has really shown in Taiwanese is that they can resist, that they can find ways to, to push back. Um, but I do think it's also started a debate as to how to do that because, um, you know, maybe something we'll get into is, you know, the Taiwanese uh, military service is going through reforms, um, speaking to, young men and especially a lot of them are quite disillusioned by what they've learned in their military service they're they're thinking how would i resist you know how would i uh, sign up how would i fight i don't know how to fight so you've you've seen uh, more interest in in um organizations that are providing uh, you know gun range experience um we're talking about airsoft weapons not real weapons but you've seen a, a huge uptick in people learning how to fight and, and defend themselves. You've also seen more um, humanitarian NGOs offering courses in uh, first aid, in resilience, how to survive in a crisis. And I, I think that there's also a sense among the Taiwanese that they, they would like more training. They would like to know how to, how would they survive if the power went down? Um, if the hospitals weren't working, because they see that that's what the Ukrainians have, you know, they've had to, uh, especially in the early days of the war around Kyiv, um, in, in the suburbs of, you know, in the commuter towns of Irpin, Bucha, people had to really survive themselves for, for weeks, you know, there was no one to sweep, like, um, sweep in to rescue them initially. Uh, and so I think that's, that's really given the Taiwanese positive thought. I mean, you arrived in Taiwan relatively recently, um, having you know come from reporting in in Ukraine. What's your impression of of sort of the mood on the ground there, and how does it compare to the feelings of you know the, the atmosphere in Ukraine, which is directly under attack? Yeah, I mean, just to reiterate what what Nikki said is, it does feel you know relatively normal being in Taipei. It doesn't have that same sense of urgency was happening in, in many parts of Ukraine, obviously, you know, who are under attack, but it, it feels normal. And I think a lot of people who are not in, on this side of the world do get confused and they think maybe people are rushing to shelters or there is checkpoints um, on the road. But like I said, Taipei is very normal. And I think it's, again, what Nikki said, obviously with the Ukraine war happening in the last few months, Russia's war in Ukraine happening, the the discussion has definitely increased amongst um, 
younger Taiwanese who I've spoken to about how they could help if China were to invade. And I think perhaps there's been some um, sections of the younger generation in Taiwan who have been more relaxed about any potential threat, but it definitely the, 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 the war in Ukraine has, has increased the discussion. And I, I mean, the people I've spoken to, um, one uh, sort of activist and NGO worker, she had um, signed up to be an EMT worker and she got her training because of the potential in the future. So I think, um, you know, there is an increase of, uh, it, it's in people's thoughts more, but it's not. On the ground in Ukraine, for example, I mean, even even when I was there in, in March, April, there was, um, you know, military and soldiers who were, you know, plain clothed. And you can, it was very obvious that there was a lot of military on the ground and there's a lot of tension. Um, a lot of obviously businesses were closed at that point um, in, in, in like Kiev. It's a little bit different nowadays um, in, in Western Ukraine. But it, like I said, in Taiwan, it, 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 everything's going as normal. Um, you know, it's still very hot at this time of the year. Traffic's still very busy and um, people are getting on with their everyday lives um you know as if as if nothing's happening but like nick said think things have um increased in the discussion space so both ukraine and taiwan share this unfortunate situation of being the target of these not just these territorial claims but these cultural claims by these huge neighbors the claim by russians or many russians that ukrainians are really russians that their identity is false that they're a false nation the claim obviously by um and while russia has give has formally given up that claim on the state on the state level it still makes it through media we see these this constant rhetoric of ukraine being an artificial nation uh in taiwan of course china claims not just that Taiwan, it, that Taiwan itself doesn't exist, that it's an illegitimate country. It works very hard to close it off, um, to close it off from the world, to, to try and prevent it joining international organizations. Um, and it claims that Taiwanese are, are Chinese. And uh, now when we look at polling, that's very much not the case. Taiwanese increasingly assert their, their identity as their own people. Um, but Nikki, how do, how do Taiwanese relate to that kind of cultural heritage of China um, while keeping a political sort of distance or, or emphasizing their their own status, their own uniqueness? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's a very good question. I mean, um, politically, there's, a, there's really a very small minority who would want to unify with China. Um, and Taiwanese identity has really grown in the past few decades you mentioned polls you know the vast majority of of people who live here would identify as Taiwanese and I don't think that 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 is um I think people really value uh, cultural links with China in terms of you know uh things like food or you know they they, they appreciate a lot about um, Chinese culture um, and traditions, uh, but I think the, the major difference is that Taiwan has really evolved into democracy, you know, since the end of martial law in, in the 1980s, and they treasure their democracy, they treasure their freedoms um, and their freedom of speech. They fought hard for it, you know, thousands were disappeared or, or died during the martial law era, and they really fought hard to make themselves um, this, this very lively democracy um, with, uh, you know, to see a Taiwanese election campaign, it, it, it's, it's so fascinating, it's so colourful, and, and people celebrate that. And, I think, you know, the Taiwanese are very keen to make that distinction that, you know, while there are um, traditions that have come from China, there, there are similarities in, um, in cultures that they are very distinct um, in that they don't want authoritarianism, they don't want to, they don't want authoritarian rule. Um, and that has really been cemented even further since the Hong Kong protests where 
you know, any idea of, um, you know, Beijing proposing one country, two systems was just being blown out of the water by, by Hong Kong and what they saw there and how they saw how Beijing just crushed dissent and these, you know, just crushed the voices of millions of people who were, who were on the streets. And that has a very um, uh, strong psychological impact in Taiwan uh, that already built upon this very strong sense of, of, of separate identity. And, and I think one of the one of the issues in what's been happening recently um, with the Pelosi visit, with um, you know, various other flashpoints, is that very often it's uh, Taiwan is denied its voice or it, Taiwan's voice is not listened to enough. Um, you know, we, we see a lot of commentary from the US, um, from China, from, you know, Taiwan seen as this kind of geopolitical pawn and, and it's denied its agency often. And, and I think that's something that really needs to change and is changing. We've seen this odd trend in US commentary recently too, to, to value Taiwan for the sake of its uh, semiconductors, of its, its for its chip industry, which is, uh, you know, a key part of the global supply chain, and sometimes it seems as though that gets treated as the thing that's at stake rather than the the future of the Taiwanese um, people and the the right of people to make their own decisions. Um, Tommy, you reported extensively from Hong Kong during the during the protests. Um, how did young Hong How did young Hong Kongers see their relationship with China, and what did they believe that they were fighting for? What did they think? that they could uh, achieve through the protests or hope to achieve? Well, I mean, obviously, well, the 2019 protests um, obviously derived from the from a proposed um, extradition bill uh, to China, and obviously that eventually sparked um, demonstrations of, of um, and calls for further demands uh, in terms of, you know, things like universal suffrage and, um, you know, police accountability, things like that. During them demonstrate their demonstrations, you know, in Hong Kong, they were very keen to separate themselves from, um, you know, being controlled or being under Beijing's grip and and, and life there, and really keen for the you know the Sino agreement, uh, the, you know, the one country two systems agreement to be upheld until 2047, which was signed in 1997, and the handover from from Britain. Um, so, you know, when you go to Hong Kong, you know, someone obviously I'm from the UK it, and I've been to China several times, it does feel very different to being in China. And I think that's what Hong Kongers cherish. They cherish their own unique identity, the, the, you know, how things were done in Hong Kong, the, the way, of, way of living. Um, and even, even the term Hong Konger, it really caught on, I think, from the protests. I think even in, I think it had only been entered in the Oxford Dictionary maybe eight years ago, Hong Kong. I think people would, might have previously referred to Hong, people from Hong Kong as Hong Kongese. I know people, uh, friends and people from Hong Kong, if they're called Chinese from maybe from, from people who are, who are not familiar with this part of the world, it's almost an offense. So, you know, the sense of identity that Hong Kongers have were represented through these demonstrations and they were desperate to, to sort of preserve their own, uh, you know, limited autonomy that they were promised. Um, and really, you know, based on the, on the protesters on the ground, really desperate to segregate themselves from, um, from China, from, from being, uh, you know, grouped together with China, you know, of course there's, ma you know, major links there. Hong Kong is part of the country of China, but, they really saw themselves as distinct and unique. Oh. All good? Uh, so my connection's being a, a little un being a little <laughs> unstable, so I hope it holds up. Uh, always all... the risk with Zoom. It's uh, I think we yeah, we might have all frozen for a second there. Um you know, you, obviously in Ukraine too, you have this situation where for, for Taiwanese, you know, you have to be well into your 80s by now to remember the Republic of China, to remember the actually being in, in the mainland. For Ukrainians, you know, you have the situation where if you're in your 
your forties, you grew up as part of the same as part of the same nation as Russia. You grew up as as mutual Soviet citizens as mutual Soviet citizens, and you know you traveled to Moscow, you went to university in Russia, you had all these connections, which to some degree held up for a long time, even after um, even after uh, independence. What's how do Ukrainians see see Russians now? How do they how do they view Russians, and how do they view that kind of Russian heritage? That sort of shared sense that there once was of a shared Kiev and Rus of a shared Soviet identity, or all of that has that completely gone on um, because of the invasion? No, I don't think it's completely gone. I mean, there's parts of Ukraine, especially in the uh, the eastern parts of Ukraine, where there's definitely more people are more uh, more refer to themselves as more being Russian than than Ukraine. So. But obviously, with with certain cities and towns that have been occupied by Russia, or there has been, let's say, um, real conflict, and you know there've been, um, you know, there's been a lot of battles in, in, in the towns and the cities. There, there is there is some change in mindsets that people are thinking. Well, okay, I, I feel maybe now I, f- I should be more Ukrainian because of what's happening. So people are sort of looking at this this invasion and they're thinking, you know. Does, should I be supporting Ukraine here? And people on the ground are obviously looking at it and thinking, well, this is, you know, this was terrible. And, and the flip, and, and, and obviously that that brings sympathy for the Ukrainian defense. But at the, at the same time, there are, I mean, I spoke to a Russian family, a pro Russian family in um, Kramatorsk in Donbass recently, and they were evacuating. And we were talking about how they, they felt pressured to become more Ukrainian with maybe Ukrainian language and sort of, um, you know, conforming to Ukrainian culture. Um, and they were evacuating because Russia was shelling their, their, their town, their city. And um, they were still defiant with their support for Russia. They were saying, well, Russia are only target military targets. And, but they were evacuating because their next door neighbor had been shelled in a residential building. So we were like, okay, how do you explain that? But yeah, again, so even even in the in the midst of conflict and, you know, on the front line of it for these residents, people will still support Russia. Um, But there is a there is some changing um, sentiment towards towards what Russia is doing. And and so it's not totally uh, within Ukraine. It's not totally uh, against Russia. But, yeah, like I said, um, the more the war goes on. The more devastation that's happening, the likeliness that it's going to change more. Uh, typically, historically, people's uh, pro-Russian people's minds um, that you know that they uh, that they not, might not see themselves as pro-Russian in the future. I was I was struck, uh, in you know, the early days of the war, there was a video uh, of these um, all Russian speaking, all they kind of classically kind of um, like rural Russian guys, you know, big faces, cheerful, kind of all this thing, riding, pulling a captured Russian vehicle behind them on with their tractor while shouting, shouting in Russian, glory to Ukraine. Um, and that struck me as kind of one of these telling moments of, you know, I, as you say, identity being made, identity being transformed by, yeah. by the war itself. Um, and, you know, it's a very slippery thing, really, uh, identity and you know we're all British we 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 can all see that in a much more reduced and peaceful form in something like Scottish identity and the sense of being Scottish even having increased quite dramatically in the last sort of three or four decades um, as a dis- as a distinct thing from Britishness um, in an entirely you know peaceful and fairly ha- fairly happy and productive way that in in somewhat contrast with these uh, with the imperial states um, Nikki uh, we talked about talked about Taiwan's, you know, the the defense arg- the defense argument, the argument over conscription, um, and um, one of the things that there has been this fear that the changes over the conscription system, the changes in the way defense has been organized, have caused Taiwan to actually be in a weaker position, to be in a a more vulnerable position. Is that a discussion that's very live in in ordinary Taiwanese society at the moment, or is it kind of restricted to the sort of military nerd circles? 
It, it's definitely live. It's very slow, though. Uh, I mean, it's very kind of, uh, it's a slow paced discussion. Uh, it's definitely live. Um, people all have a, an opinion about it. You know, you're going out and doing box pops and, and speaking to people about it and everyone has a view. Um, so it's not something that is just exclusively for military nerd circles, um, you know, until you get into, you can really get into the weeds about um, defense um, capabilities and what weapons would work and, you know, which platforms are the best. And, and then it does really get, it's important, but nerdy. Um, when it comes to military conscription, I, I definitely think it's something that the general population are, um, I wouldn't say anxious about, but they're conscious that that there needs to be there needs to be reform, and there's very different views on on what that should be. Uh, you know, it used to be there used to be two years uh, compulsory military service for young men. Now it's four months, um, and it, anyone I've spoken to who's done that service has been quite derisory about it in terms of what they've learned, in terms of. Um, how confident they feel uh, about how they could fight back. They don't get much. Uh, they don't get much experience on the gun range, and a lot of it can be quite bogged down in red tape. And I think that's a big concern for Taiwan. And it's it, 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 the Taiwanese know that uh, because it's it, it's part of um, when you look at Ukraine, it wasn't. Obviously, the long-range weaponry is making a huge difference, um, and weapons are extremely important, and that's a big part of uh, Taiwan's debate as well about which weapons to buy uh, that would be a, an adequate deterrence to China. But it, it, if you look at Ukraine, it's an all-of-country approach as well. I mean, the, the population got on board, and, and one thing that you know, looking at it from, from as an outsider. Um, seemed to take Russia by surprise was the strength of the opposition with, from the, the population itself. But, you know, people really resisted and fought back in any way they could. And for Taiwan, that is a huge part of the debate as well. It's not just about what weapons America is going to sell to them, um, uh, you know, if they're going to get F-35s or not. It's, is the population ready? Is the army ready? Are the reservists ready? And certainly um, you have within military circles, uh, you have Admiral Lee, uh, Lee Shi Min, who was um, until 2019, he was the head of, of um, the armed forces. And, and he, he had a whole doctrine of um, her defense and deterrence strategy where people would be trained, like you would have a civil defense force. And so ordinary people would be trained in, in how to uh, defend a community. And that adds to the, def the deterrence effect. It, 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 you know, the, the whole idea is to, to make China fear that they could be humiliated in not being able to invade Taiwan within a matter of days or be bogged down in a very bloody conflict and that the risk it just isn't worth it. You know, if it's any reassurance to the Taiwanese, uh, the compulsory Chinese military training for students is five days long and you get to shoot. Uh, you, sorry, it's a week long and you get to shoot five bullets at the end of it. Um, it's mostly a propaganda opportunity and a chance for the PLA guys to try and hit on college yeah. students. Um, okay. <laughs> so it's not, it's le less of a formidable mi military machine and like yeah, a lot of the PLA's like capabilities sort of slightly sketchy absolutely and it's a good point i mean you know the chinese military on paper it looks so formidable and it, you know they've, they've had such a massive military build-up but they haven't been tested in battle and that is got to be something that president xi is thinking as well you know how would how would the military perform how would the navy perform crossing the taiwan strait is not easy taiwan is you know it's investing in coastal missile defense systems that could really make it painful you know to, to cross the strait there's only a very few landing beaches um it's a very mountainous country it's it's actually got a lot of advantages um when it comes to defense and and you know having an advantage over over an enemy and of course we we saw in ukraine that 
the question of corruption in the army and the question of the capabilities of the army. Um, it seems like many of us overestimated the Russian capabilities in part because so much was being stolen uh, at the Russian end or these units mm -hmm. were being badly organized. We've had a lot of interesting kind of leaks and so on from there. Um, question for, for either, either of you. You know, we talked about like Ukraine has this whole of society effort now, this this to sort of, you know, really total war in a sense that most countries have not seen since World War II. Um, how does that change Ukraine after the war? What does it mean? What does it mean for the for the state? Does does Ukraine become sort of something like Israel, this kind of fortress state where the military and the, the role of defense um, is the, the foundation of sort of nationhood and something that everybody participates in in the long run? Perhaps. I mean, <laughs> it's a big question. I know just just throwing the, the just throwing the, the easy ones to you, Tommy. Well, look, I mean, obviously, people in Ukraine, and especially who are opposed to Russia, they, they don't trust trust anything that Russia says in terms of there's going to be any breakthrough diplomatic agreement or ceasefire. So if you're talking about, I think Ukraine expect that even though we're six months into the, this war, even if there was a pause, that there would be, you know, things would resume at some point in the future. And they believe that Russia doesn't, doesn't just have Ukraine in its sights, it's other parts of Europe. So, it, it, so I think there will be, they will be on guard for a long time and i think that that's basically um you know they're, they're very proud to be able to defend and continue this one like you said you know russia there was obviously some some reports and predictions that russia would be able to take kiev in a matter of days failed miserably so i think you know ukraine as a nation have took you know real inspiration with that and i think yeah i think they'll, they'll be on guard now for any uh, future and it's, well, i say any future obviously this is an ongoing war but you know even if things were to stop tomorrow, there would be concern that things would start up again. And I think for, for Ukraine, they're going to have to be on guard. And I think that's, that's, that, I don't think they have any problem with that. And we already saw one sort of big remaking of the Ukrainian army after 2014, um, when they were really kind of a, a shambles. Um, and so the sort of sense of, you know, of, of the, the military, military service becoming a big thing, um, continues, I guess, and will will continue. Um, Nikki, on the the Taiwanese side, how how much do you think? Can I? I'm going to start drawing in some of the questions from the audience here. How much do you think people can actually imagine themselves fighting? Like, how much do you think people actually think of, you know, street warfare, urban resistance, any of the sort of scenarios of, of Chinese invasion that leave ornate Taiwanese like fighting or even occupied as something that could happen to them, rather than this sort of fantastic possibility it's a really good question because it, it it's so hard to answer it's so hard for a Taiwanese or anyone to answer uh you know how would you react if your worst nightmares came true it's very hard to conceptualize when uh, you know as we said things are just so peaceful here just now and people are just getting on with their lives so I don't know if anybody really knows how they would react uh, in, in the worst case scenario of, of an invasion. And I, I think that was something that really struck me when I was in Ukraine and I was only there for, for three weeks, so I'm certainly no expert on Ukraine. But speaking to ordinary people, they all had a story to tell of how they reacted when the war started. And you know, many people left and that was the right decision for them. With, with, with Taiwan, that would be much harder to do because they would really have to have advance notice. It's an island that you can't just easily cross a border. So I think there would be a lot more people here who would be forced to confront um, those questions because they've got nowhere else to go. Uh, but in Ukraine, uh, you had a lot of people who were ready to fight and, and they were, uh, you know, they didn't know how to, they didn't know how to join up. I, I was speaking to people who said, well, I tried to join the military and they said, no, you have no experience. So then they went and you know tried to join some kind of militia. And so the, there was that desire to fight. And I, I definitely think you would have the, the exact same contingent of people in Taiwan who would have the same reaction. Uh, you know, just going along to the gun range recently, uh, there were 
the, the class that we watched it was um, an advanced class and it was all men but there were a lot of women who'd signed up as well just you know to learn the basics of of how to fire a gun uh, the question would then be in Taiwan where would the guns come from because you know guns are not legal here for, for the general population but I do and I do also think that uh, people would be willing to take more of a, um, a less of a frontline role as well uh, like Tommy mentioned this, is this um, training to in, in emergency medical care uh, people would be very much willing to do that uh, and just you know anyone I've spoken to has has given me a response of what they think they could do even you know I went to Keelung Harbour a few months ago and spoke to a couple of older women in their 60s and they said yeah you know we'd pick up a gun we'd fight and it's just so hard to tell in advance, really, but it's definitely in the public consciousness, you know, of what would we do? I mean, I have some experience with Taiwanese grandmothers and I wouldn't bet, I wouldn't bet against them in a fight. <laughs> They're pretty formidable. It's, yeah, uh, um, pretty fierce. So another uh, question from the audience. Um, we've seen big disinformation campaigns in both Ukraine um, and Taiwan, you know, uh, obviously, uh, in, in Ukraine, you had a lot of stuff targeted at the Russian speaking population. You also have these global kind of Russian propaganda efforts um, that haven't, have looked rather feeble in some cases, um, in, at least in the West of late, but have had a big impact in India, in Africa, in, in other um, countries that are sort of somewhat neutral in these conflicts. In Taiwan, there's this constant worry of Chinese disinformation, particularly around uh, particularly around political campaigns. We saw the fears that China was trying to basically back the KMT uh, in the elections. Um, and sometimes these sort of quite vitriolic exchanges about who is being backed by China and, and who isn't. What do you think that states can do to, to, to combat disinformation campaigns? And especially what can democratic states that value the space for freedom of speech, freedom of discussion do about this? Hmm. Well, I mean, I think that's definitely one thing that Ukraine has done very well is, is putting out its narrative uh, on social media. I, you know, as a visiting journalist when I was there, they, I, I got there in June, so it was already a few months into the war, but they had a, a, a press room that was set up that was actually actively helping international journalists. And you have, uh, you have they've used Telegram very well, they've used social media extremely well. You had Zelensky you know, at, at the very start of the war, you know, with these videos saying, I'm here. And I, I think they've really, um, I, I, I agree with your point that Russia has, the, the Russian narrative has kind of gotten a grip in other parts of the world. But I think uh, definitely the Ukrainian government has done really well at pushing out um, its own story and also giving access to information like, you know, when there, there was the, the awful um, missile attack in Kremlin took uh, a few weeks ago, a few months ago. Yeah. And you, you had um, Anton Garashenko, uh, the advisor to the Justice Ministry, who's got very high profile on Twitter and he was there immediately and he was saying, come see what's happened. And they got in very quickly to counter that Russian narrative and I, I think you have to have a very dedicated part of your government you have to take the the information war is so serious that you have to have a very dedicated it's almost like having a different military unit that's just you know dedicated to countering disinformation and Taiwan is actually uh, quite ahead of the game in that in, in many respects because they have been on the front line of Chinese disinformation for so long that it's not something that I, I think they're actually pretty good at countering it among their own the Taiwanese population. They have a dedicated organization that is constantly looking for fake news and debunking it. And you saw that during the pandemic, where they would just kind of make a joke out of Chinese dis disinformation, where you know China was trying to to push forward this this uh, narrative that. Taiwan was hiding the bodies and that lots of people had died from COVID and, and that your government is lying to you. And that just didn't take hold. I think what they do need to do better, and it, it, you know, the, it's definitely been shifting in the past few years. There have been improvements in, in selling. Taiwan needs to sell its story to the world better. And I think they do need someone who would take on that role of, you know, in a crisis. And even now, 
you know, just pushing out this this uh, opposing views to 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 what China is trying to portray as, you know, China is trying to seize the narrative over the Taiwan Strait. You've got the, the wolf warrior diplomats who keep putting out um, false information about what what the one China policy, the US one China policy is versus, you know, the, the one China principle that Beijing holds. And you see this constantly. And I, I do think that's where Taiwan has to fight back harder now and also work out its strategy of how would we handle the international media? How would we handle international opinion in an invasion scenario? How would we do that on Twitter, on Telegram, on other social media platforms? And so at the moment, I think it's just a little bit too inwardly focused. Michael, this is you know, the internet connection between Taiwan and the rest of the world runs through really cut in the event of war, leaving people with um leaving people with satellite connections and very limited means. Um but Tommy, um you were with you know the the Hong Kong protesters who had really amazing message discipline um during the whole or in a lot of cases during during the protests and were were very effective at reaching international media. Um what what problems do you think they had, or what, what what do you think that there were issues with the way they tried to handle it, or are they a model of kind of success, even if it was to a point where they eventually had China basically force this law upon them to 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 stop them winning, to, to stop that success? I think the communication, the communications during during the Hong Kong protests. I mean, I think there was what wasn't. I read something recently that it was the most live streamed, you know, political unrest maybe in history at that time. I mean, I, I, but it was definitely uh, the, the use of communication, social media, Telegram, live streams, and, uh, you know, Facebook, Twitter, it really contributed to providing exposure to what was happening in Hong Kong. And I think, um, I mean, me and Nikki were both there. It, for me personally, it felt like Hong Kong was at the center of the world. It was constantly in the news. There was constant protests every week and those protests um crucially were well publicized through various means of social media and and, and news spheres so um obviously hong kong was well covered and i think that's you know being in ukraine for example um the use of telegram and like nikki said the the the, the media access and knowledge is very um it's very it's you know it's there it's very open it's very accessible you know, there's there's press dedicated press centers. There's constant uh, telegram notifications about press conferences from mayors, from government officials, um, you know, from spokespeople. Whether there's been a missile attack, like Nikki mentioned in Kremenchuk, or you know, recent developments of the war. So, I think that's vital for 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 both of um, you know these you know these historic events that that, that the, the access and people are getting the right knowledge. Um, you know, through all means of of communication, uh, you know, tools. Obviously, we live we live in a, uh, in a world now where social media is the cent essential to news. You know, it's where we get our news first. And you know, even in Ukraine and Hong Kong, to cater to a, sort of the younger generation through more so, let's say, younger apps like TikTok and things like that. People, there has been that. There has been that progress of showing what's happening. So. I think in terms of uh, what Hong Kong did, I think, like I said, it was, it was there was a lot of exposure on that, and 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 definitely lessons have been, um, or tips have been taken on board with with what's happening in Ukraine, and you know, just going to the point, both, both uh, even though there was obviously unrest in Hong Kong, and obviously we could talk about the state of the free media there at the moment, and obviously press freedom crackdowns at the time. Hong Kong was very open for journalists and, and people have said to me it was a journalist dream. The access was the first year in 2019, 2020, and then the national security law came in. Of course, that changed. But the first year it was very open. So the information that, you know, um, was, you know, very accessible. And Ukraine's like that as well. Ukraine has been very welcoming to journalists, very keen for journalists to go to, um, you know, recent incident sites and, 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 and 
you know, the, the, the access to speak to government officials or, you know, contacts, um, you know, mayor, mayors of states and things like that. It's been, it's been, you know, really workable as, as, as a reporter on the ground. And um, that's, that's crucial if, if, if the world's going to continue to, uh, to know what's happening there. Yeah, I mean, in, in contrast, you know, I cover Xinjiang and Tibet a lot, and it's this wow. constant battle to try and get information out uh, to verify sources, um, you know, the, even to get photographs, the amount of closure, especially since the pandemic, but even before then has been remarkable. We've had these major, you know, population movements, people rounded up, all this kind of thing that we're tracing through satellite and make it over the border into India, where, you know, in Ukraine, you can pretty much, journalists can pretty much walk into a government ministry and find the minister and talk to them a lot of the time, um, and they're very keen to talk to you. It's quite yep. something. So we've talked a lot about, you know, what sort of Taiwan can learn from, from Ukraine, what Ukraine has done. What do we think that, what do we think China is doing? What lessons is China learning from the invasion of Ukraine and from Russia's failures? How, how do you think Beijing's likely to alter its own, you know, approaches, strategies, having seen not just the Russian military failures, but also the surprisingly strong, in some ways, Western response? Keith, that's, a really, that's a really good question. I mean. Does anyone really know what Beijing is thinking? But I, yeah. you know, I, I think one thing that they'll definitely be looking at is how the population of Ukraine reacted. You know, you can invade a country, but that doesn't necessarily mean you can hold a country and that you have a lot of uh, civil resistance, you have urban warfare. Um, I'm sure that's something that they're looking at. And also, as you mentioned, the strength of the international reaction, I, I think that's probably, you know, that's definitely given them pause for thought not only from governments, but also from uh, private uh, private companies and, you know, conglomerates and, and how um, the private sector has reacted to Russia. And uh, yeah, that, that would definitely be something that would uh, come into China's consideration, you know, how badly would our economy be damaged? And I'm sure that's something that they're, you know, they're strategizing by how would we counter that? And, you know, what kind of coercive or um, coercive tactic, the tactics could we use or also incentives? Could, you know, we give people not to take that reaction if we invade Taiwan? And, and I, the business, side of it is incredibly interesting as well you know you mentioned the semiconductors and it, it is a very cold way to look at the situation because taiwan is just you know this um it's a democracy is 23.5 million people it's it's it, they all have their right to live in peace and in freedom but if you want you know very often the world just operates on yeah out of financial concerns and so actually Taiwan um, being so crucial to the semiconductor supply does give it a degree of protection because it makes people more interested and it's, it's a very calculated way to look at it but it can also work to Taiwan's advantage. Yeah I think just just to add on that point I think um, obviously just away from the economic side of it but I just I think if what Beijing's taking from um, the war I think Recently, there was a Chinese ambassador to France who said that um, there would be a re-education uh, scheme, if that's the right word, if, if China were to you know, reunify, how they say, Taiwan. So I think they're thinking about how, how the Taiwanese people would react to Beijing being in control. And I think that's a concern because of what's happened in Russia, uh, what's happened in Ukraine, there has been this resilience from the Ukrainians and I think there was a perception from the Russian side that a lot of the Ukrainians would automatically just adapt and 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 be, and, and be, you know be happy to be under this new Russian rule if, if you know if um, they had um, took over Kiev so I think I think Beijing might be thinking a little bit more about how the Taiwanese would uh, resist and um, 
whether they would just automatically conform to what Beijing wants wants from them if they were to to take to take Taiwan. Uh, that's, a, one... that's a good. Sorry, I was go just going to say no, that's, go on, that's, that's, that, that's a good point that Tommy's making. That also they, they'll be learning. They've, been learning from Hong Kong as well. And you see how these attempts to re-educate the population there and the, the way that you know, there's been changes made to school curriculum. And one of the things I felt when I was in the Hong Kong protest was that they were kind of terrified of the younger generation. There were, you know, it was teenagers who were out protesting against them and, you know, kids in their school uniforms. And, and that I think uh, they've really, they're really trying to crush and, you know, kind of learning from that uh, you know hopefully it will never happen to to taiwan but you know that i'm sure that's part of beijing's calculations to how to even just change children's minds the, the skill curriculums that kind of thing one of the things we've seen in fact in the mainland has been this uh, big emphasis upon patriotic education at home um and as well as the cutting off of western media you know they they really went into a stage of of almost paranoia around 2012, 2013, that they were losing the culture war, that Western shows, Western media was much more influential. And we've seen just every year uh, uh, cutting not only of the space for discussion, but of what's allowed to be imported, what's allowed to be streamed, all this kind of thing. Um, that And then, you know, to some degree it's worked. It does seem as though the younger generation, the very, the sort of uh, Gen Z, as it were, um, or what Chinese would call a lingling hall, like uh, the people born in the 2000s, uh, has is more nationalistic than than its predecessors. Though, although I will would also say that public opinion in, also shifts very rapidly in China, like like most places, and we've seen this year um, a lot a big lack of a big loss of confidence after the relative sense of sort of triumph in 2021. Um, you know, there's a lot of frustration and anger uh, brooding out there now. Um, and some of that comes out in the wolf warrior diplomacy because there's a certain amount of kind of pushing it on to other countries, you know, this this like aggression in service of finding a new narrative or finding somebody to blame. Um, I'm going to take a couple more audience questions before we uh, before we wrap up. Um, so uh, one one question: How I'm, I'm going to modify these a, a, a little bit. Uh, I hope nobody in the audience minds. So Xi Jinping is in the middle of this big uh, political sort of struggle or battle in, in China at the moment to secure a third uh, a, a third term. And you can argue that he's already secured it, that it's already nailed down. But it, either way, the, you know, the 20th Party Congress um, comes up in the uh, in the fall when he'll officially get officially kind of get to exceed his predecessors and so on. Um, how closely do Taiwanese follow these Chinese political struggles and what impact do they think it has on the chances of invasion? Because, you know, there's always all these questions about, like, does she need to do something to prove himself? Does he feel that his legacy has to be secured? How, how closely are they, like, uh, uh, as it were, Kremlinologists or Zhonglan Haiologists in this case? I think, yeah, they definitely are. They're definitely following what's happening closely in, in the mainland. I, I, any development there that could impact them, and, and not only the Taiwanese, but I, I think also, you know, the, the Japanese, the Koreans, you know, everyone regionally is, is following very closely. And one of, but one of the big problems is that it's, the Chinese Communist Party is so inaccessible to the outside world. Xi Jinping is so inaccessible uh, that it's very hard to predict how he's going to react. You know, is he going to look at economic calculations and say, I don't want to risk, um, you know, China's uh, great rejuvenation um, and don't want to take the, the uh, military risk uh, of defeat or humiliation. Uh, but then does he have, does he also have uh, voices within the Communist Party who are pushing him to be more nationalistic, to take that risk? And that's the, that's the dangerous area that we're in just now because nobody really knows what external factors are going to be the most powerful in deciding you know what his actions what actions he takes and so that's why we're now left in a situation where you know we can probably say pretty confidently that that there's not going to be 
an invasion in the next year, but then you have other predictions that it could be in three to four years, it could be in 10, it could be never. Um, you know, China could opt to try and, and squeeze Taiwan economically rather than militarily through a blockade. And so, yeah, Taiwan is watching very closely for any uh, indication or any development that could give them a better idea of what to plan for. Um, and as are the US and everyone else in the region. Uh, Tommy, we've been talking about Hong Kong as though it was, you know, a defeat, which obviously it, 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 meant it was. Um, the, the, that sense of loss is very profound there among, among Hong Kongers. What do you think can still be done there? Like what, what chances are there still to fight for the values that the movement was, was you know, uh, wanted for freedom of speech, for um, some kind of, of democratic values. Is it completely hopeless? Are there things that can be done? It's very, look, it's a, it's a very, um, it's a question that, you know, I'm asking people on the ground in Hong Kong because I think with this national security law came in in 2020, which basically prohibits any acts uh, deemed, you know, um, as, you know, subversion, secession, so you know, foreign influence, terrorism, how how the government fits. It's it's a very um, strict law that is defined by by the authorities and the government. So at the moment, it's um, it's a bit you know the, the future is a bit cloudy in that aspect. It's such a new law. There's there's you know hundreds of people still waiting for trial. You know, a lot without juries. Um, and you know, so at the moment a lot of the protest movement, whether they're in Hong Kong or outside of Hong Kong, it, it's it's a sort of wait and see. The national security law has been so crushing to that to that movement. It's prompted, you know, mass emig uh, immigration um, as well. And, you know, for the people who, who are in Hong Kong, I think the only thing you could do whilst you're there is to resist in little ways, maybe, go and eat food or buy things from shops, stores, establishments who are more sympathetic with the pro-democracy movement and who are less um, on the pro-government, pro-Beijing side, things like that. But any form of, let's say, uh, you know, any form of resistance in terms of holding a yellow umbrella or things like that, the very quickly cracked down upon. I mean, I think there was there was a there was a court case last year or earlier this year where some of the um the, the, the people who were watching the court case, which I think was a national security law case, were wearing yellow face masks. And then they were told that they weren't allowed to wear them because it could symbolize some form of support for the pro-democracy movement. So there's it's 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 very that the pro-democracy movement at the moment there, it's it's like I said, the national security law has been very enforceful and it's 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 difficult to see at the moment with with so many trials waiting uh, to be heard and the inevitability of so many people who are going to go to jail for a long time under that security law that Beijing imposed for anyone who didn't know. Yeah. And unfortunately, of course, we've seen this doubling down in China itself of these kind of ideological and symbolic paranoias. Uh, we saw one of the country's most popular uh, live streamers, you know, watched by tens of millions of people, being pulled roughly off air for having accidentally a cake that looked like a tank uh, on the uh, on the eve before the Tiananmen uh, anniversary, and he still hasn't returned to the air, as far as I know. Mm. Well, we've got a lot of good questions still waiting, but unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us, Tommy and, and Nikki, and um, if you, you want... Uh, Tommy, where can people follow you on social media to see your to see your reporting? Twitter. And Twitter is like the media uh, sphere, isn't it? Um, for, for journalists, Twitter. Uh, what's my Twitter handle? Tommy Walker, CO. Um, and uh, if anyone wants to check out my reports or portfolio website, TommyWalkerMedia.com. And Nikki, for you? Twitter mainly. So my Twitter handle is at Nikki J. Smith, which is N-I-C-C-I, -C -C -I, and also in the Telegraph. 
And you can follow me at uh, Beijing Palmer or read from Policy's China Brief, which is a, a weekly newsletter about Chinese affairs that I, I write when I'm not on holiday in Alaska. And to learn more about World Affairs, head to their website, www.worldaffairs.org, where you can find out about upcoming live stream and in-person events, past recordings, and more information about their radio show and podcast. And thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, thank you to the audience for those very good questions and for listening, and hope to see you all at the next event. Thank you. Thanks for having Thank, me. Thanks. Thank you.